everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry and Poultry Podcast, where today we're going to have part 29 of my interview with Matthew Buckley Smith. No, I'm just kidding. That's done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. That's good. Oh, good times. Good times. No, we're going to be going over um, a bunch of stuff. And I'm wondering if I'm going to hit the the Alice Allen shit today. Am I going to hit the Alice Allen shit today? Um, I had a bunch of emails. Because some of them weren't coming in specifically for the podcast, they were coming in for the YouTube channel, I started answering some of them on YouTube. But some of them were for the podcast. So um, I will hit that. So we're going to go over some emails here in a minute. Um, we'll probably do the Alice Allen thing here in a minute. And you guys are like, what the fuck is he talking about? Um, but first, but first, what is normally first on this? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I remember now. I remember now, darling. I remember. It is giving this fucking show five stars. Because you know you want to. What shit accent was that? It probably went to a couple different ones there. I don't fucking know. Okay. So, let's hit those motherfucking shoutouts. Yeah. So, I want to give a big thank you to you lovely people over on Patreon. Michael, Harry, Cedar, Deborah. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you fully and again i think there's more for you guys if you move over to youtube and support me there just saying and then i want to give a big thank you to the thank you crew here on the youtubes so i want to give a big thank you to patrick to brit to jh and big hugs to alan and am i know you're out there guys um and, and i'm keeping your seat warm now for the big swinging penises over at the Anarchy Crew. And for those of you who are penisless, I don't mean any shit by it. I just mean you're you're a big swinging badass, okay? So let's just cut to the chase. I, I think I'm saying dicks too much on these podcasts, and that's why I keep getting um, ad blocks on YouTube, whatever. So I want to give a big thank you to Nate, to Mindy, to Bunny, to Thomas, to Tim, to Lisa, to Josh, to Jessica, to Shaylin, to Caitlin, and to, I think this is how you want me to say it now, Mk. let me know if I'm saying that wrong. If not, let me know. And then a big thank you to our number one chappy, SDG. All of you guys are fucking amazing. I love you all. Anything I can do to make your lives better, you guys fucking let me know. That's that's the fucking exchange we got here. What can I do for you all? Let me know. And if you want to be one of these big, badass mamma jammas, all you got to do is go over to my YouTube page. And if you don't know how to get there, you can either just go to YouTube and type at Matt Wall. Or you could go to my fucking website, I hate Matt Wall. G nope. <clears throat> That's not it. I hate Matt And click the YouTube icon and it will take you to my page. And then there will be a little button that says join. You will push that button. And there, it will give you three options. And next year, there are going to be five options. So put that in your fucking pipe and smoke it. But these options are the thank you crew the Anarchy Crew, and the Chapbook of the Month Club. Thank you, crew. Gets the little things here and there throughout the month. Just letting me know how much they appreciate me. And they get to see me wearing this beautiful sequent gown that I'm going to wear to the ball tonight with my glass slippers. But since you're just listening, you don't fucking know that, okay? Because you're a cheap ass... And you want other people to pay for your entertainment, basically. And that's fucked up, guys. But if you are in the Anarchy Crew, 
you get the Poetic Anarchy course, over 100 videos of lessons and workshops and weekly live streams specifically for the Anarchy Crew members. And if you're in the chat book of the month club, you get all that plus all the shit I make that month sent to your home where you can open it and touch it and feel it and smell it and be it. Do you guys see what I'm saying? I'm giving you life. All right. So with that said, get on over to that. Do that. Give this show five stars. Oh, you know what? Let's fucking do that. I'm going to read to you some comments because maybe that will give you the kick in the taint you need to do the right fucking thing. So let, let's let's go look at that. Let's fucking go look at that. I'm mad now. We're, we're going to fucking look at that. So here we go. First. First. Here it is. Here's a five-star review. I am officially on board the Matt Wall hate train. Very, very good, good review there. Next, it says Matt Wall rule, and then it like cuts off. But then it says, Matt talks all things poetry and publishing. He's hilarious. That is a very astute observation, pencil breaker. Next, what a charm. It might be charmer. I'm, I'm going to guess. It again cuts off. I Hate Matt Wall is unlike any other poetry podcast. Give it a listen! Because there's an exclamation point there. I agree. This is unlike any other poetry podcast. I think that's it. Oh, and there's one more. My mom really likes them. Cool. I, I like that one too. So there you go. Um, a bunch of five-star fucking ratings. And all you have to do is quit being a fucking bitch and get off your ass and go over there and fucking do the right thing. Do I gotta fucking pay you people? Do I have to fucking give you money to go fucking do the thing that you should be doing anyway? Unbelievable. So with all that said, let's move on to the shoe. Oh fuck, my hair is a fucking, oh my God, I have like a Jimmy Neutron curl. God, you could ride a fucking surfboard on that thing. God damn. Caught a tube this morning, boss. All right. So here we are. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the things that I'm posting this week on um, my videos. So um, as far as the Anarchy crew goes, um, this, this week, I think, what poetry means to you and what, like, when you think of poetry... What does it make you feel? What does it make you do? What what do you do because of that? Okay. Um, and then there's like writing prompts and shit that go with that whole thing. So that's this week for the Anarchy Crew. Um, videos that I'm putting up this week, I, I answered some questions. I answered, um, I wonder when this will come out. I think all the videos will be out that I've already done. So I answer some questions. One is how to write when you don't want to write. Or wait, no. How to write when you want to write but you can't write. I think is, I don't know. It's something along those lines. It's an email I got. Then I got an email about character names. And when you're writing, like how do you pick character names that aren't shit? And that one was kind of a long video because depending on what kind of book you're writing, there could be different reasons why those names are shit. So there's that. So if that stuff interests you, run over to my YouTube channel and you can watch those videos. Actually, I might have links in the description. I don't know. Um, another thing, though, um, is that I went through my year and um, like all the shit I did this year, like all the accomplishments I had, because as you know, I've had a rough fucking go of it the last couple weeks. So going through a list of my accomplishments felt really fucking good. Um, and I'm going to just kind of go through a little bit of it right now because I did forget something that we will talk about here in a minute. So I put out 19 chapbooks this year, one paperback book, three ebooks. I got over 500 new subs on YouTube, um, nearly 20 members um, since I started the join thing. Um, the blood rag started, and that's been going great. Issue six is out now. 
Um, I put out two EPs of my solo music um, and would have done more, but my guitar hit a snag. I made four short films this year, and I also started Horrywood and did the first five chapters of that. And the reason why that's been kind of delayed is because I'm not digging Kindle Vela as a platform for it. So I'm going to be taking it um, elsewhere. But there's some kind of fucking rule where I have to wait a certain amount of time. Some fucking bullshit. But the other thing that I did not talk about... Oh, and I also have made like over 50 paintings this year, which is great. Um, And I actually show a bunch of the ones that I did last night. So if you want to see those paintings... You could watch that video. But the one thing I didn't talk about was this podcast. Um, I've made probably, I don't know, I started the podcast up again after almost a year away and um, have done, I don't know, like 17 or 18 episodes so far this year which is great and like just amazing things like um i was on slee rickets that was great and then matthew's been on here a couple times um and i've been talking to like people like alice which we will talk about in a little bit and um found ethan through slee rickets so um just this whole growing growth is huge You always want to be growing. You never want to be stagnant. So if you are feeling kind of down or like whatever, make a list of all the accomplishments you've hit this year. Because if you're listening to this show, if you are hearing the sound of my voice, I know that you've been doing stuff. I know because I know I'm a fucking inspiring motherfucker. So if you've been around me for fucking three seconds, you're going to want to go out there and do something. It's just how it's always been. I understand this. So what have you done? Tell me what you've done. I would love to hear what you've done. Send me an email. I hate Matt Walt, gmail.com. List your fucking accomplishments so I could praise your fucking ass on the next episode. For fuck's sake. I'm trying to do you a fucking favor. God damn it. Do the fucking thing. Fuck me. All right. So those videos are up on um, the tubes. The tubes. Okay, so now let's get into some emails here. Uh! So this one um, is a bit on the lengthy side, but you know me, I'm a size queen, so I dig it. So this is from Ethan. He says, I'm sorry to hear about the ways you've been struggling lately, mentally and physically. That fucking sucks, man. I hope things are getting better for you. Time can be hard anyway without the added pressures. That is fucking true. Um, So thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. And Ethan came to the live stream that I did last week. Was it last week? Yes. Um, He says, I enjoy coming to the live stream on Sunday. It was a lot of fun. And he really dug the series of interviews with Matthew. Oh, yeah. And he fucking points out me being a dumbass. So this is good. Um, first, when you were discussing critics and critics and cockroaches, great title, by the way. Thank you. I was very proud of that myself. Um, bada, 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 bada. Um, I completely get where you're coming from. That was Roger Ebert who wrote the script for and was heavily involved in um, the uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Um, but wasn't that supposed to be dumb as a satire, basically a joke? Um, I'm not super into that level of irony, but I think some of what was bad about the movie was purposeful. Um, And he made other cheapo, naughty movies, too. Now, here's the thing. Yes, I, I don't know if it was like a satire as much as it was just trashy for the sake of being trashy. Like, I don't know if you've seen that movie, but the way that movie ends... Like, it's so funny because if that movie were to come out today, it would be like so shocking because I could ruin the fucking ending for you. Yeah, I'll just ruin the ending for you guys. So if you haven't seen Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, skip the next 45 seconds. And if you think you're going to watch it, so skip the next 45 seconds. Yeah. So it, at the end of the movie, it turns out that the the villain of the movie who is trying to keep this girl band down is not only a Nazi, but trans. Boom! It's like Tucker Carlson would be fucking frothing at the mouth over this thing. So, yeah, it's just, it's fucking ridiculous. But then he goes on to um, hit up a lot of um, great things here. 
where he says like numerous serious, well-respected film critics also made great films. And I, I totally understand. And I think I even said on the episode, like I'm sure that there's been tons of people who've done great shit. But he goes into it and says, um, Frank Nugent wrote several of John Ford's greatest films. James Agney wrote um, African Queen and Night of the Hunter. Um, Night of the Hunter, Jesus Christ, that's fucking amazing. Um, in France, um, Truffaut and Godard started the French New Wave movement, movement not only in their movies, but also criticism. Um, Zimmerman and Jay Cox wrote great screenplays for Martin Scorsese. Um, Peter uh, Bogdanovich uh, made excellent movies too and then of course my favorite Paul Schrader the Christian Calvinist who got his start as a prominent critic and then wrote and or directed the classics Taxi Driver, Hardcore, Raging Bull Bringing Out the Dead and many others those are all good too man um, there are many silly critics who are exactly the kind you are describing but when I think of good criticism I think of something that tries to be outside of a conveyor belt commercialism. I want criticism to be insightful enough to help both audiences and artists think more deeply and carefully about art or to think about art in a new way. This isn't the simple thumbs up or thumbs down of Siskel and Ebert or the soulless number crunching of Rotten Tomatoes or the silliness extricated in the fantastic show The Critic. It's neither about affecting box office nor about turning fun art academic. It should be about getting good everyday readers to think about the art they consume. Now, this is 100% accurate, okay? The problem I see with this is that as time goes on, that is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, until, like, I don't even know if it will continue. Just the idea that, sure, there are critics out there who are really fucking good and insightful and make somebody think. But I feel like what is more prevalent is that critics look at themselves as gatekeepers, okay? Okay. They look at themselves as social influencers. And yes, you will have people, especially, let me let me change this up a little bit. Because when um, me and Bucks were talking about Bloom, for instance, he does like critiques on shit that's been out, okay? Like, or did. So it's not like he had to every week review like all 15 shit movies that came out or review every art gallery in fucking New York that week. You know, like I think when you have to go out and like judge stuff constantly doing the thumbs up or the numbers is a lot easier than trying to fucking like think critically and say something insightful about that kind of shit. The problem is most places who have people who are critics do the thing where they go out every week and have to fucking figure all this shit out. It's not like there are, like, there's still critics. Like, the insightful fuckers are critics, and the fucking people who fucking make up the meta score of fucking Rotten Tomatoes are also critics. They're the same fucking thing. There's no distinction, at least on paper. So that's where this is going down. And the more people who are fine being a percentage in a Rotten Tomatoes score, the less you're going to have these like brilliant academic fucking things like that. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I don't think there's a good way of seeing this in the future. Like, I think it's just bad. Like, I really feel like if newspapers want to succeed, they're going to start giving, like, fucking, I don't know, Kim Kardashian a fucking um, a movie column to talk about what movie she likes. Because people give a shit, which is funny as shit, people give a shit what Kim Kardashian thinks. People don't give a shit about what, I don't know, Dick Byer, film critic from Tulsa, thinks. You know what I'm saying? 
So, I don't know. Like, I think you guys see where I'm going with this. Ethan goes on. Um, a great example of this is Pauline Kael's 1969 essay, Trash Art in the Movies, which Alice talked about me sending her on the most recent Poetry Says episode being bad. Did you hear that episode? By God, I did, my friend. And it's so weird that you would ask that on a day when my whole fucking job would be to talk about that episode. So this is all circular. We are all together. We are the double helix. Yes, that is what's happening right now. Now for a totally different subject. Now for something completely different. Uh, when you were talking, I think it was with Matthew on your most recent I Hate Matt Wall episode about being prolific. I was thinking about how so many of today's rappers have your approach. Get as much material out there as you can and let the people decide. I don't know how you feel about their kind of music, but I enjoy some of it. I was also thinking about, oh shit, I don't know if I should even talk about that if I don't have anything to say about it. Okay, I'm going to hold off that bit. Um, because Ethan, that next sentence you wrote there, this is inside baseball, but just me and Ethan right now. And everyone has to listen and not know what we're talking about. I really don't know his work, but his episodes made me probably more angry than any other episode. And I would love to fucking talk to him. Do you talk to him? Cause I was thinking about reaching out to him, um, since, uh, it seems like him and I are the um, the black sheep from that side of the fence, if you know what I mean. Yeah, Ethan, thank you so much for the email. So about this thing about being prolific, get as much material out there as you can and let the people decide. Do I feel that's how it is? And yes, and I will tell you how a lot of this came about. A lot of this is because when I first started creating art i was in like the la punk scene okay a hundred fucking years ago and we would write songs and i would write anywhere from like three to five sometimes six or seven or eight songs a night and um take them to the band the next day and we would play them and then do our fucking thing and go play a set we would have 30 minutes so because we only have 30 minutes, we go, okay, well, fuck, how many songs can we fit in 30 minutes? Okay, well, let's speed these songs up, and then we can put a couple more songs in. And it was just like this fucking like onslaught, you know? And I still fucking remember this. I was 14 years old. The first time I went to a recording studio with the band I was in to lay some tracks down for um, our demo tape. And we went in, and I can't remember how much it was. I think it was like... I think it cost 150 bucks. I think we had two hours of recording time and then an hour of mixing and mastering or something like that is what came with it. So we had like a handful of songs that we wanted to do and, and more than a handful. We were going to see how many we could get done. And I remember this is before seatbelt laws and I was sitting in the back of Mike's pickup truck and we're driving down the freeway and I have like a little piece of paper and a pen and I'm trying to write lyrics for one of the songs that we didn't have lyrics for yet that I would normally scat over. I'd just be like, and shit like that. Um, and so I had to like write the lyrics and try to memorize them. And it actually was for a couple songs, I remember. And then we went in and recorded as many songs as we fucking could and just fucking went and went and went. And I think the final tally, we ended up with 14 for that demo tape. So that was cool. But then even like when Creeperson was going, um, on the second Creeperson album, I had uh, one weekend to do that. Um, this producer was like, it's a long story, but he was like, hey, you have a bit of clout up here. Let's, I'll record your album. And then like, you can tell everybody that I recorded your album and all this other shit. So it was cool. And we went in there and um, I played all the instruments because the band couldn't come up. Because, again, I was in Oregon now and the band was still in Southern California. But I was up in Oregon trying to make a movie. And so I um, recorded all the instruments for that. Um, and then one of the songs, um, the song called Flesh Eater, there, there was never a second verse to it. 
I like scatted my way through it all the time. And I thought it was funny. And then I'm like, shit, do I write a second verse? And I'm like, fuck it. No, I'm not going to fucking write a second verse. So I just fucking did the same fucking thing. And then there was a little bit of time left after we finished Sunday morning. Because it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I'm like, hey, can I play my acoustic and record an acoustic album real quick? And so my album, uh, Folk Songs for the Dead, the Matt Wall solo album, that was recorded in one sitting, like guitar, guitar mic'd, me mic'd, and I just like played through. And um, some of the songs didn't make it on because I was fucked up while I was playing it, so those missed. But the ones that are left are the ones that I did that day. So yeah, just like that whole thing. And then like, like skin slip, like you can see me, like I recorded me recording that album. And it's basically like one take of each song. I was recording it on my iPhone and then sending the tracks over to my computer, you know, like it's all about like capturing the moment you know, like doing that thing and then doing as much of it as fucking possible. I mean, I just said I put out 15, 19 fucking chapbooks this year. 19 fucking chapbooks. That's fucking crazy. You put stuff out because different things are going to ring true to other people. So I have some chapbooks about the desert and off-grid living and shit like that. That it will ring true with some people. I have a couple chapbooks about living in Los Angeles that's going to ring true with some people. I have chapbooks about writing. That's going to like ring true for some people. You know, like it's it's kind of like a shotgun method. It's kind of like throwing spaghetti at the wall, but the difference here is, and I think the shotgun method's a better analogy because with spaghetti, some of it sticks, some of it doesn't. But it's really what wall you're throwing it on. Because I could throw spaghetti at this wall, and this wall might be into, like I said, off-grid living. Some of that spaghetti is going to stick. The dude over here is going to really like it if it's a bunch of writing fucking advice. You know what I'm saying? Some people like poetry. Some people like um, short stories. Some people like novels. Some people like short films. Some people like music. Some people like punk. Some people like... It's exhausting. I'm fucking getting tired talking about this. But yes, you do as much as you fucking can and let the audience decide. And if the audience is still like hungry, then you fucking feed them. You know, like if your baby's fucking crying, you fucking put your nipple in its mouth. You know what I'm saying? Jesus. It's that kind of thing. I will feed you baby birds. I will chew this up and then vomit it into your mouth hole. Ethan, I don't know if that answered your question. Um, as far as rap goes, it's funny because they were talking about it on that Slee Ricketts episode about, I think they were actually on the Secret Show episode talking about how like, you know, it's not like a lot of white kids w were out listening to NWA, you know, because like um, they waited for Eminem or I can't remember exactly how it was pronounced and I, or said, and I'm like, I fucking listened to NWA. Like I was fucking like I grew up minutes from Compton. So, yeah, dude. Like, NWA was hard. And I listened also to Run DMC and the Fat Boys and Two Live Crew and Tone Loke. Loked After Dark. Ooh. Um, yeah, and DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. I was all over everything. I was hard. Hard. But I kind of don't listen to anything anymore other than The Cramps, Ton of Ska, First Wave and Second Wave, sometimes Third Wave blues like old blues and that's pretty much it I, i'll go through phases where like i'll hit other stuff that i like like the other day i was listening to cannibal corpse for a little bit um haven't done that in a bit i hope that answered your question yeah i'll read the email okay because if you listen to the poetry says podcast which i highly recommend you do um it is hosted by Alice Allen, who is lovely as shit, super fucking sweet, lovely fucking person, who just fucking loves poetry. I usually get angry <laughs> a lot when I listen to her episodes about the, when she's interviewing people. Not all the time, but sometimes. But um, the episodes where she's just 
like thinking out loud are fucking brilliant. And it's so funny. I say thinking out loud, but I know she puts a lot of thought and a lot of time into her episodes because even in the post-production, there's like tons of shit she cuts to and everything like that. So she does a really good job of making it sound like a stream of consciousness kind of thing. But it is very much planned out. So yeah, go check it out. Now, the funny thing is, is that, oh, this is fucking hysterical. Because I did this interview with Matthew a while ago. Chopped it up, put it out. Since then, he put out his, the, uh, what episode was it? Was it the Risk episodes on Slee Ricketts? That I think we referred to a little bit. Shit, was that right or not? I don't know. But then Alice did this episode talking about being bad. And the funny thing is, is that all of us were talking about kind of the same shit. And Ethan, who sent me the email that I read earlier, also sent Alice um, this article about trash and art and critics and all this other fucking shit. And it's just funny how all of this stuff, it's like this uh, collective consciousness. Like we're all worried about the same shit at the same time. It's just, it's a fucking riot. It's fucking funny as shit. Well, anyway, so what I suggest you do, go listen to Poetry Says. Um, I think it's still the latest episode. It's I think it's called Being Bad. Um, I don't remember what episode number it is. But um, listen to that episode and then come back because I wrote a a dissertation, I guess, back to Alice about all this stuff. And um, I don't think she would read everything I sent. So uh, but I think a lot of it's good shit to talk about. Go listen to that and I'll be I'll be right here. I'll wait. You're back. Awesome. I hope you liked that episode. Was it good? I liked it. Okay. So now we could talk about what I was saying about it. So here we go. Okay. So in the episode, Alice talks about going to read at this like open mic thing, this virtual open mic thing, and how Alice didn't know if her poems were good enough, if her poems were good. She thought they were good but then started second guessing and and that's doubt and i talk about doubt all the fucking time and anarchy crew you know about fucking doubt you know how doubt fucking rolls we're, we're not friends with doubt so what i said to that i said the answer to everything you talked about is confidence you have to have confidence you need to know that you are the shit and that your poems are fucking fire That's the answer. So if you stop listening to this podcast right now, you have every answer you need about doubt and how to overcome it. You need confidence. You need to know that you are the fucking shit and that your poems are fucking fire. They are. So just fucking own it and know it. Okay? That's it. Know it. Now, some of you might be going, but that's really hard. Why is it hard? It's hard because you don't have the confidence. So, you're good. You know you're good. People tell you you're good. Own it. Own it. You're fire. You can do this. And I will say this. You need to never, ever, ever compare yourself to other people. Because as soon as you do that, things start getting fucked. So, just know that you are the best fucking poet that you are that there is no one on the fucking planet past or present or future that can be a better you than fucking you own it have that confidence you are the shit your poems are fucking fire okay now i have some hot takes (laughs) i have some takes on you (laughs) Okay, so one of the things that they talked about on that episode, or that she talked about on that episode, was at this um, writing workshop she was at, someone said, and it was like the mantra of the thing, if you can get away with it, you can get away with it. Like, oh shit, I don't know if I should do this thing. Well, fuck, if you could get away with it, you could get away with it. Now, 
to me, hearing it like that, like red flags went off. Because when you say it like that, you are implying that the person who's getting away with it is faking it. If you don't have to fake it, there's nothing to get away with. Do you understand what I'm saying? So don't fake it. Be fucking real. And that's like one of my biggest fucking arguments to poets. Be fucking real. Show your fucking true self. Be you. Be the best you you can fucking be. You shouldn't have to ever get away with something. You should always just do the thing because you're not faking it. That's, to me, that's the biggest difference. Now, some people might go, well, you're just arguing semantics now. And maybe I am, but I still feel that if you don't have to fake something, it comes off as more real. Why? Because it's fucking real. Faking shit is bad. Faking poetry is worse. If, if you're faking your poetry, that's fucking like, that, that's not okay. So there was that. And then there was some talk about strip clubs, strippers and stuff like this. So this is my take on strip clubs. I don't like them myself because I personally find it insulting to have to pay someone to pretend to have sex with me. That's fucking like the truth fucking for real. It is horribly insulting for me to tip a woman to pretend to be interested in me. That is awful, awful, awful. Like, I, I just, that makes my skin crawl. But I have worked with many strippers and adult stars. And when they take everything off, there's nothing left. This is not true. That was the statement that was made on the episode. The art is in what happens after the fact. I have seen people strip that were super hot that had nothing after the fact. Then I've seen others who I would shrug at, which is something else that was said in the episode, um, that totally blew me away by what they did after. And this is fucking no bullshit. A lot of people think that a stripper's like money is in, hey, I just took my clothes off. Look at what you have here. This is not true, dude. I've seen strippers do amazing fucking feats of human ingenuity. Okay, I've seen them do things that a normal human being should never be able to do. And it is fucking impressive. Okay, it's not the fact that they took their clothes off. It's what they do after the clothes are off that makes a stripper successful or not. And that's an art. There are definitely artists when it comes to that world. Maybe I will hit this. Yeah, I'll fucking hit this up because I, f I hear this a lot and it pisses me off. And I don't hear this a lot. I hear this more on other poetry podcasts I listen to that aren't um, the big three, let's say. And you realize, like, what's the big three? Obviously, this one, Poetry Says and Sleet Rickets. Those are the fucking big three, okay? This is the Penguin Random House, Simon and Schuster fucking world of podcasts here. But I hear people complain about shit. And when you look at what the complaints are, if you boil down what people's complaints are at the end of the day, a lot of the problems people have with poetry seem to be very superficial. And um, that drives me fucking crazy. It was in one of the blood rags, but I have this poem that says, how does it fucking go? I'll probably just read it. Um, it was in the second blood rag. It says, slice your throat and bleed out. Get a paper cut. Drip a drop. Blood is blood. The size of the wound isn't the poetry. It's the bleeding. Okay. And I feel like a lot of people feel like the size of the wound is the art. And it's not. It's the blood. You can have a poem about something totally horrific or something completely mundane. But if you bleed when you fucking write that, motherfuckers will know. And I feel like a lot of the poetry community is focusing on wound size. Bunch of size queens, this fucking poetry community is. 
Oh, and there, there was some shit about trash films and stuff. Yeah, I'll fucking hit this up too. Okay, so as far as the trash thing goes, I've made films. I live in LA. I made over 50 super low budget features. Um, as someone who is a fan of those films, I got something out of watching John Waters and Ed Wood and Roger Corman, etc. I got inspiration. That is something you can't even put a value on. That is huge, and honestly, I don't think any of those guys were thinking that the films they would make would influence generations. And this came up because of the article that Ethan sent Alice, because one of the things was talking about how you shouldn't try to make more out of trash than it being trash. Like, you shouldn't try to find the artistic value in it if it's made to be just like a trashy thing. And I fucking completely disagree. I find more value in trash art than I do in shit that a lot of people fucking like, you know? So, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, again, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, you know? So, don't fucking sell motherfuckers short. And then there was this one person, a critic who fucking said this thing, talking about this other poet who probably writes a, a lot more like I do. And she said, you know, like, oh, because the original chick said, this is so stupid how I'm doing this. I really should have thought this out better. Alice, I apologize. Listeners, I apologize. Viewers, I don't apologize because you get to look at me while I try to fucking figure my way out of this fucking thing right now. This one poet said... I find writing poetry as easy as frying an egg. It's just something you do, you know? And I fucking agree. And then this chick comes in and says, oh, that's bullshit because, you know, um, it's not just frying an egg. There's multiple egg dishes you can make. And, you know, like um, some of them take a long time to master and all this other shit. And you got to, like, try this and try that and whatever. And I don't fucking know. Some, some shit about egg making. And so I said, this, that's a bullshit argument for this reason only. You can't revise an omelet, okay? Because that was the thing, like making an omelet and stuff like that. Meaning, if you fuck up an omelet, you fuck the omelet up. It's done. You can't revise that omelet. You have made the fucked up omelet. So I've cooked many different kinds of egg dishes. And just like frying a simple egg, you get one shot at it. Plus, it really doesn't take that much more time whatever egg dish you want. You can fucking poach an egg. You can fucking fry an egg. You can over easy an egg. You can over hard an egg. You can fucking um, sunny side up an egg. You could fucking omelet an egg. You could fucking Benedict an egg. You can fucking do all sorts of shit to an egg. And it basically takes the same amount of time and you basically get one shot at it. So whether you are swinging for the fences or just doing something fucking simple, just do it the first time and be done with it. And if you're going to be that much of a stickler, just do it right the first time. For fuck's sake. Poetry is so fucking funny. And I'm going to fucking get on a little fucking soapbox here for a second. I'm trying to think of another fucking, like, profession. But this is the funny part. Most poets don't consider poetry a profession. Try to think of a job that you can fuck something up. Fuck it up, fuck it up, fuck it up, put it in a drawer, fuck it up for 10 fucking years before you finish the project to give to your supervisor. It's fucking ludicrous. Every other profession in the world, your goal is to fucking do it right the fucking first time or else your ass gets fired. Okay? And some of you are going, but this is art. It's not fucking... Da -da -da. Okay, so let's talk about theater. If you were a stage actor and you fucked up every night, would you have a job? No. I don't know. Lead a horse to water, am I right, guys? Okay, whatever... This is me talking about. Whenever anyone says you have to hide stuff in a poem or that things shouldn't be discovered right away. Those people are afraid. Those people are the fakes listed above. They don't want to spill themselves on the page because they are ashamed. They are the ones who fear risk in their art. So when it ceases to become art and becomes something that can be judged objectively, people who show 
up to the poem naked and bleeding scare people like her. So like a true pro, she writes a book of criticism about them to make her feel better about her own shortcomings. Boom! Shots fired. Man down. Man down. Uh, breaker, breaker. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, that, that is what we call slay. Like, did you hear it just now? It's like, finish him. And I'm like, get over here. <laughs> yeah. Fatality. And then I keep going. I have a theory that every poem is someone's favorite poem. Some people hate this, but, um, you can't disprove it. So no matter what you think, uh, if you think a poem is shit, it doesn't matter. Someone may love it. That's art. It is subjective. There's no fault if you don't like a poem, no fault on you, and no fault on the poem. It's okay if a poem isn't for you, it's for someone else. It's fine, no fault needed. Risk is art. <clears throat> if there is no risk in what you do, you are not creating art. You are going through the motions, sending stuff out, uh, burying your soul to strangers, putting it on paper for future generations. All of this is risk. All of this is putting your head on the chopping block. It's rolling the dice. That is risk. Just like you risk embarrassment in reading and editing that Halsey poem. That poem you feel, uh, that poem made you feel something. It was uncomfortable. You had a visceral you have a visceral reaction proves how successful of a piece of art it was. If you felt nothing and shrugged, that is bad. But even that may move someone else. That poem did to you exactly what it was supposed to do. It made you feel. Now, if you don't know what this is about, on that episode, Alice talks about how I wrote in talking about another episode where she read a poem by Halsey. Uh, maybe I'll read it. Maybe I'll read it. Whenever you create anything, you should feel a sense of worry or fear. That means you did something. When you don't feel that weird, exciting sense of dread, you are complacent. That's when you need to hang up your pen. I, I think that's mixing metaphors there, guys. But anyway, so um, I fucking love Alice, and that's a great episode. And it was just a lot of fun going back and forth with Alice there. Um, so I appreciate that. Anyway, so let me see if I could find that Halsey poem. And I'll fucking read it and I'll read it hard. And then that way, Nancy could feel better. Name's not Nancy. I just realized that. The name was... Oh, shit, it started with an S. Was it Sarah? No. Was it Savannah? Savannah? No, I think I got strippers on my head now. Let me see. Is this the Halsey episode? Halsey? Okay, let me see. Is this it? Oh my fucking god, I think it is. Let me see. I don't know if this is the whole poem, but this is the image that I have here. So it's called Freckles on the Face of California. Sitting on the patio furniture, I spent a fucking fortune on. But we only seem to use it as a place to cry. Where we won't be heard by the people inside. I look across the valley in the city lights like freckles on the face of California. I said, I'm not mad, and you can fuck who you want to fuck. I'll only cause a riot if I hear you making love. But really, I'm just trying to keep my body from dissolving into a film that'll swim around the rim of this glass of wine. I know your mother hates me. You don't have to lie. And I've spent a few nights on the phone with mine. But she said we can fix it, and she won't pick sides, because she hopes that you'll give me a baby. She's crazy. She did the same thing to my dad. Now he hates me. And all he ever gave me was freckles on my face in California. That's a fucking brilliant poem. I, I don't understand what the problem is. It, it's emotional. It fucking talks about shit. It goes back and forth between the main idea of the poem and the problems, and then circles back around, comes back to the main idea. It's it's fucking brilliant. I, I fucking love it. I think it's great. I, I, I know nothing of Halsey except that poem, uh, and that my kid was really into Halsey for a hot minute. So that's cool. Like, I'm, I'm glad we had this talk, everybody. So now, for a quick 
version of the butt plugs. Okay, butt plugs, here we go. Join the mailing list, get the free ebook. You want me to mentor your shit? Go to my mentor thing on my website, ihatemountwall.com slash mentorship. Join the fucking anarchy crew, do the right thing. Five stars, keep buying my books. MacArthur Park, out now. You know all the things, my music's everywhere. Everything's great, and if you have a question, send it to ihatemountwall at gmail.com, and I'll read it on the show, and I'll talk about it. So until next time, everybody, type hard, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.